Good morning. Good morning. All right. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, for those of you that haven't been with us in a few weeks, I want to catch you up to speed a little bit. We've been in this series ca- talking about the do's and don'ts. And what we're looking in this is a lot of us today have kind of taken our faith. And if we've reduced it to a list of do's and don'ts, you know, kind of some moral law that's, hey, this is the right thing. This is the wrong thing. Our faith can actually become kind of fragile And the next time some wind blows, we can kind of fall over and kind of fall off of our faith. But when we look at the first few centuries of Christianity, their faith is amazing. Because in the first few centuries, I mean, they were tortured for their faith. They were put in coliseums for entertainment to die. I mean, people were burned alive at the stake to light Nero's uh, garden parties at night. I mean, it was extreme. And their faith had to be extreme to a certain extent. I mean, all they'd have to do is renounce Jesus and they would have been totally fine, but they didn't. And sometimes I wonder when kind of some hard things come our way, we kind of walk away from the faith. And when we look at their faith, I mean, if you weren't Jewish, you were a Gentile. And as Gentiles, they kind of look at, hey, I got to find some God to serve. So that way he'll be nice to me. And, and if he's nice to me, then life will be a little bit easier. But then for for when they heard about Jesus, then they're stepping in and going, wait a second, you mean this Jesus is the son of God? He, he came not so that I serve him, but to serve me? And he gives his life on the cross. And in that, and what Pastor Keith was just talking about, he rises from the grave three days later. That changes everything, doesn't it? Okay. He dies. He's in the tomb. Three days later, He rises from the dead. All right, we're getting there. That's exciting because that changed everything. Their faith was founded not on, hey, we've got these moral laws of do's and don'ts, you know, in the Bible. They didn't have that. They just had some letters circulating around at that time, but they had the commands of Jesus and they had the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And in this, they had some commands that they heard from Jesus and the disciples, when they first heard these, they're going, (laughs) easier said than done. Like, do not fear, do not worry, do not sin, okay? These are all like sound nice, but they're not always easy to live out, okay? But when Jesus rises from the dead, it makes all this actually possible, okay? It changes, it flips the perspective. It gets us looking at it from another angle. So today, we're gonna look at the command that Jesus gave, do not doubt, say doubt. Oh my goodness, do not doubt. That's one of those ones that we all struggle with doubt. If we're all honest with ourselves, we struggle with it. I've struggled with it. Do not doubt is one of those things that sound like, yeah, that's not quite easy. Uh, Easier said than done for sure. But as a pastor, I have a lot of conversations with people about doubt. You know, they're saying, pastor, do you ever doubt? (laughs) No, I'm not a sinner like you. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Of course I doubt. I doubt, you doubt. We all struggle in doubt. Now, if you like to take notes on, the, on your worship guide there, I want you to grab that because I wanna give you a couple of things that I hopefully are gonna help you as we have this conversation today about doubt, okay? Typically, doubt falls into two components, all right? When you're dealing with doubt, it falls into two components. The very first one, the very thing that we're really struggling with or component that we're wrestling with in doubt is this one. Is it worth it? Write that down. Is it worth it? Man, is it really worth it? Not only with Jesus and our faith, but in other areas where we're struggling in doubt, we're asking, is this really worth it? The second component that we're going to deal with when we're dealing with doubt is, is it true? Say true. I mean, is it true? Is Jesus true? Is this faith I have true? Is, and we can go on and on when we're dealing with doubt. So these two components we wrestle with, we deal with, we're asking when we're struggling with doubt. So Is it worth it? And is it true? We all wrestle with this, okay? So, and that's not uncommon. Now, there is a story that I wanna take you to. So if you want, you can start making your way to the book of Matthew, okay? Uh, It's the first book in the New Testament. As you're making your way there, uh, I wanna kind of set this story up for you. Now, uh, the disciples, they're in this boat. They're rowing across the lake, all right? It's been a long go of it. It's, they've been rowing through the night probably. It's getting early in the morning and Jesus didn't get in the boat with them. He sent them on their way, okay? So they're kind of wondering probably how Jesus is gonna catch up with them, whatever it is, but they're trying to get across this water and all of a sudden in the distance, they see this ghostly figure and it's walking to them on the boat 
and they're getting a little bit freaked out by it, okay? I don't know about you, but I'd be a little freaked out if I'm on a boat and it's dark out and some person is walking on the water, it seems like, okay? So here's where we're gonna pick up. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 is where we're gonna pick up. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now just pause there for a second. I don't know about you, but if I saw something on the water, I'm gonna go, hey, why don't you tell me to come out to you? Yeah, no, Peter, you're crazy, okay? I mean, but they're seeing him walk on the water. Peter says, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, some of you, if you've been in church very long, you've maybe heard this story before. But this is one of those amazing moments where Peter gets out. He says, yeah, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. So he's walking on the water. He starts noticing the wind, the waves, all this stuff. And he loses sight of Jesus. And that's when he begins to sink. So we always are going to struggle with our doubt when we take our eyes off of Jesus. And now that may not seem revolutionary to some of you, but for some of us, we've got to recognize that when our eyes do fall away from Jesus, doubt definitely creeps in, okay? Now, here's what I want us to do. I want us to kind of just take inventory for a second. Um, have you ever doubted? Some of you have amazing gifts of faith, I see. So we've doubted. And Peter, we see just here doubted as he's sinking in the water. He's not the only one, though. We have John the Baptist. He was kind of the predecessor to Jesus. He's setting up, getting ready for Jesus to come. He's out in the wilderness, you know, calling everybody to repent. He's baptizing them, all this stuff. But then later on, he's arrested. He's in jail. He's in prison. He sends one of his disciples to Jesus. And, and he goes, hey, Jesus, hey, you know, your, your cousin John, you know, hanging out in prison. Hey, he wanted me to ask you this. Um, are you the Messiah or should we look for another? He struggled with doubt. In that, he struggled with doubt. But yet Jesus didn't respond in harsh ways because really what was John struggling with? <laughs> is Jesus worth it? And is he true? But then you have another one who was a disciple of Jesus and uh, maybe you've heard of him. He struggled with doubt. Matter of fact, he got a nickname. Anybody know his nickname? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. He's a disciple of Jesus. He didn't get that nickname when he's following Jesus right at the beginning. He didn't get that nickname right in the middle of Jesus' ministry of three years. He didn't get it right in the middle. He didn't even get it when he died on the cross. He got it after he rose from the dead. Because he's going, wait a second. Jesus, if that's you, I want to touch the scars and the wounds in your body. He gets the name Doubting Thomas from this. And yet, what was it he was struggling with? He was going, Jesus, my world just got rocked. Are you really worth it? And are you true? Are you the truth? We all struggle with doubt. And I think here's the deal. In all of this, we need to understand that when we doubt, Jesus doesn't toss us out. I mean, when we are struggling with doubt, Jesus, I mean, reached out his hand for Peter. He didn't kick uh, John the Baptist to the curb and say, you know what? If that's your attitude, forget you. He doesn't tell Doubting Thomas, he doesn't say, you know what, forget it, you can't be my disciple anymore. That's something that we need to understand, and that's a conversation that I think maybe some of us haven't had in church, and we haven't felt that it's safe to have in church. It's okay if you're wrestling with doubt and you follow Jesus. It's okay. Say, it's okay. Some of us need to get that, and you're like, no, it's not okay. No, you're not gonna be struck by a bolt of lightning, I promise. I mean, these guys weren't. And it's okay. We're not the only ones that struggle with doubt. We're not the only ones that have asked, is this worth it and is it true? All right. Now, again, go back to Matthew 14, verse 30. We're going to pick back up in the story here. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out to the Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Again, he didn't let him drown. He didn't go, hey, here's an object lesson, disciples. Watch Peter drown. He's not doing that to you. He's not going, ha, watch you just drift away. No, he's reaching out his hand. And just as he reached out his hand to Peter, you need to understand that in your doubt, Jesus reaches out his hand to you. Some of you need to hear that. He reaches out his hand to you. He doesn't let you fail and fall so far. 
But we have to come to the place where we're gonna look at doubt seriously and we gotta start talking about it in church. We gotta start being real about our faith and not faking it till we make it, okay? That don't work. So there's another story that is interesting to me. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking down this road and they come across a fig tree. And this fig tree isn't bearing any fruit. So Jesus curses it and it withers away. And the next day they come by and they realize this fig tree is completely done. And they're amazed by this. So they start to have this conversation with Jesus. So I, you don't have to turn there, but real quick, Matthew 21, 21, this is what it says. And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have, the faith, have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Now, some of us in our American church, we read this and we think, mm-hmm, all right, God, I don't wanna climb this mountain, so you need to move it. I got this obstacle, you need to get it out of my way. And we start kind of naming it and claiming it and all this good stuff, right? All right, and what happens is, is that sometimes the mountain or the obstacle in our way is exactly what we need to go over or through. It's kind of hard to admit, isn't it? But what do we like in, in American Christianity today? We like the microwave Christianity, don't we? I want my faith to be microwaved. It's quick. Woo! <laughs> you guys are going like, I don't like this pastor. <laughs> He's mean. I'm telling you, that's, I'm just being honest with you about where I'm at, where I get sometimes with my faith. And th you need to understand the culturally here. When this verse is taking place, these are all Jewish men, okay? And in this culture and in this context, for them to go to God and say, you know what? Cast this mountain to the sea would have actually been considered disrespectful to God. And they weren't gonna disrespect and dishonor God and that, that demand, that's not the point that Jesus is making here. And we gotta understand culturally, that's not what this is about, but we wanna take it there to make our faith easier. Hello? What he's saying here contextually is that, listen, you need to begin to have confidence in your father in heaven and understand that he is here and he wants to move on your behalf. And moving on your behalf might be you have to walk over that mountain or go through that obstacle. We don't like to hear that, but sometimes the way it is. But we need to begin to stop doubting that our Father in heaven loves us and cares for us. We need to begin to have confidence that he's working on our behalf. He's doing something for our good. That's what this is about. Now, I want you to make your way to John chapter six. As you make your way there, I kind of want to just set this up a little bit. But as you make your way to John chapter six, here's what is interesting. Jesus feeds thousands of people. Multiple times he does this. He feeds thousands of people with fish and bread. Okay, it's a pretty cool, miraculous moment. But also you need to understand contextually in this culture, it was not uncommon to go two or three days without eating because food isn't readily available like it is for us today. All right, if we're hungry, we just go to fast food. If we're hungry, we kind of go down to the supermarket. You know, we kind of go to a vending machine. They didn't have vending machines, okay? And you're like, I know, shocker, right? So in struggling with life and trying to eat. They're out in the middle of nowhere. Jesus is talking to them kind of on the shore of Galilee and all these things. And what takes place is that Jesus, instead of sending them to some small town where there probably wouldn't be enough food anyway, he feeds them bread and fish. Now, how many of you that if you don't eat on a regular basis for two to three days at a time, how many of you would say, you know what? I want to follow this dude because I get a buffet every time. Hmm? Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I get a buffet. And in this, Jesus uses this context as an illustration. And he says, you like this bread. You think this bread is good. Well, I'm the bread of life. I'm the better bread. You like this, I'm even better. But then in this conversation, this is what Jesus goes on to say. This is kind of disturbing a little bit. But he goes on and he says, you know what? You like this bread? I'm the bread of life. You know what? Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. <laughs> whoa, whoa, time out. Sorry, Hannibal, what did you say? Uh-uh, no thank you, you're freaking me out. You sound disgusting. And even we can look at that today and we go, yeah, that just sounds weird. Well, they thought it was weird too. 
Matter of fact, I want you to look at the context here, okay? All right, John 6, verse 58. And he says, this is the bread that came down from heaven. He's talking about himself. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. He's again referencing the manna that they got, you know, when we talked about Mother's Day. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Whoever feeds on me, whoever abides in me will live forever is what he's saying. Now notice what the crowd says. They're saying the same thing as you hear that statement, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, okay? This is what they say in verse 60. When many of his disciples heard this, now understand disciples isn't the 12. This is a broader sense of disciple. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? (laughs) Who can listen to this? This is crazy. Because even when we read the statement or if we look into the context of the story, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. You, You sing songs in church about the blood of the lamb. You sing songs about the sacrifice of Jesus. And it sounds a little bit crazy and disturbing, especially if you've never understood the context of the Jewish culture. But there was always a sacrifice for sin. Something innocent had to die for something guilty. And now Jesus says, you like the bread that I hooked you up with at the buffet? Well, you've got to partake of me. Now here's what's interesting. If you're gonna partake of Jesus, it is not picking up the Bible and Bible. Wow, sound like I was in the South for a second. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor Keith. <clears throat> picking up the Bible. And um, it's not picking this up and looking at it as a list of do's and don'ts. This is not behavior change. See, but that's what we've made it in church. You wonder why some of these generations of churchgoers and they have kids that aren't following Jesus. It's because we made it about behavior. And Jesus said, no, it's much deeper than that. You've got to partake of my life. That means be in relationship. Hello? That's not a microwave faith. Relationships, relationship takes time, takes process. And they listen to this and they're struggling to hear what Jesus is saying here. Now go on to verse 66. After this, many of his disciples, again in the broader sense, turned back and no longer walked with him. Can you imagine? You know, you're in a place where you don't get to eat but every other two or three days. And when you're hanging out with Jesus, you get a buffet with leftovers. You get a doggy bag. I mean, there's baskets left over every time he feeds people. And yet you hear him say the words, You've got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. You've got to partake of my life. You've got to be a part of me. You've got to have a relationship with me. You've got to abide in me. And yet in that tone, it was something where the crowd said, it's a little too much. You know, this is the hardest conversation I have with people that don't follow Jesus. People I, I truly care about. People on a regular basis that I have a conversation with and I say, you know, listen, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the hardest conversation I have with people because some people going, well, I mean, I get that Jesus was a good person and he gave his life for me and supposedly he rose from the dead, but really is he the only way? He said it here and a lot of people walked away and they were getting a buffet. They were getting the hookup in the day. But in this, we struggle with this. Because you know what? If we're honest with each other, we're all asking, is he really worth it? And is he really true? This is the battle that's going on in these disciples. Now, in this, he turns to his followers, the closer 12, okay, disciples. Verse 67. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Do you want to go away too? Are you done with me also in what I've said? (laughs) I think all of us, if we got real, Jesus wants to ask every one of us that very same question. And every one of us have battled that question at one point in our faith or another. And there are times where we battle it again and again 
and again, don't we? I do. But here is where we find a guy named Simon Peter. He is probably the biggest mouth of them all. He is, gets in more trouble by putting this in here, okay? He's got a big mouth. Don't be elbowing the person next to you right now, okay? Don't, don't. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking across the room and noticing some things, sorry. But here's the thing. Peter in his big, big mouth, he has this amazing moment of wisdom because he asks the most important question. And please write this down. This is the most important question you'll ever ask when you're dealing with doubt. This is the most important question because when you ask this question, it changes your perspective. Here's what he says in verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, Jesus if we're not gonna follow you, then who? To who else are we gonna go to? Who else is gonna help us out? Who else is gonna change our life? <laughs> These are amazing words, an amazing question. In other words, to whom shall we go? And here's the thing. If you say no to Jesus, you're saying yes to something else. That's the bottom line. If you say no to Jesus, you're saying yes to something else or someone else. I was recently called out for a death of a young lady. From all apparent looks of it, it's overdose. Here's the thing. This family at one point attended church somewhere, somehow. At one point, there was some conversation of faith. At one point, there was that involvement in the life. But when we reduce our faith to do's and don'ts, moral yeses and no's, it's not based on a relationship where Jesus says, partake of me. And when it's not part of that kind of thing, our faith isn't set into a relationship with Jesus. I'll tell you what, we're gonna easily say no to Jesus. But when you do, you say yes to something else. Because you're gonna look for fulfillment in something. You're gonna look for hope in something. You're gonna look for the feel-good, pleasurable moment in something. You say no to Jesus, you say yes to something. The question is, is what are you gonna say yes to? What are you gonna say no to? Now let's look at this whole context, all right? John 6, verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? And this is so important right here. He says, you have the words of eternal life. Hello? Amen. This is what changed everything. His resurrection. He rose from the dead. We know that he rose from the dead and that changed the faith of these first century Christians. It should change our faith. And in that, Peter declares, to whom shall we go? You're the one who has eternal life. No one else has got it. I'm gonna give you a shocker. I know it's hard to hear. This is a stat maybe you could never possibly imagine. Every one of us in this room, every one of us at every one of our campuses will die someday. <laughs> shocker, spoiler alert. <laughs> and the question is, is what happens beyond that? There is an eternity that rests out there. And the question is, is if you say no to Jesus, what are you saying yes to? Because I believe there's more beyond the grave. No one else spoke of eternal life. No one else did it like Jesus. And look at what else he said, because what I love is at the end of that, he says this, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. He's it. And when we struggle in our doubt, we're wrestling and we're saying, is he worth it? Is this true? And it's okay to have those questions. But in the midst of that battle in your mind, in your heart, the greatest question you could ever ask is the question that, G, that Peter asked, to whom shall we go? Jesus, if not you, then who? He's the only one who brought eternal life. And in your doubt, I want you to know it's okay to wrestle with it. And what could happen in the body of Christ today if we started getting real with each other? We started getting real with our kids that, you know what, I've wrestled with my faith. I've wrestled, I've doubted. 
<laughs> I'm just going, is this worth it? And is this true? But I'll tell you what, to whom else will we go? Whom else has the hope of eternal life? Who came not to get served, but to serve? And if we can move our faith from a list of do's and don'ts to a relationship that we're abiding in Jesus, it changes everything. Amen? Amen? Will you stand with me this morning? To close out this morning, I wanna give you this quote because I want you to be able to grasp this because it just isn't about this very one moment, this second today. It goes deeper and further than that. Pastor Andy Stanley said this, you'll never know what God would have done if you allow doubt to take you out. There's so many people I meet that in their doubt, they're wondering, is it worth it? Is it true? But they didn't get to the greater question, the absolute key question, to whom shall I go? What if you ask that question in the depth of your heart? What would happen for your kids? What if you ask that question in the depth of your heart, to whom shall I go? What could happen for your business? What could happen in your marriage? Some of us, we see the mountain in front of us and if God doesn't cast it into the sea, we bail. Hello? And when we bail out, <laughs> we don't know what's over the, that mountain. We don't know what's around the corner. But let me say this. Some of you have wrestled with doubt every time you walk into church, every time you hold a Bible, every time you sing a song about God, you have wrestled with doubt. I wanna remind you this morning that Jesus doesn't toss you out. He doesn't cast you aside. He simply reaches down his hand and he doesn't use you as an object lesson. He keeps you from drowning. He will keep you from drowning every time if you'll just simply say with your heart, to whom shall I go? Who else has eternal life? He is your hope. And I'll tell you this, I believe he's worth it and I believe he's true. Would you bow your head with me? At all of our campuses, if you'll bow your head, I want to ask this question. If you're here and you have been wrestling with doubt, you are struggling. You're wondering if God's worth it. You're wondering if it's true. Today you need your Father in heaven to look down on you with love and grace. And you need him to come and just encourage you to lift you up I wanna pray the Holy Spirit does that for you. Would you raise your hand? I wanna pray for you. Come on, you're not alone. It's all right. It's okay to be honest in, in church. You're not alone. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray that the Holy Spirit just envelops you with his love, that you'll have the revelation like Peter did. To whom shall we go? I'm gonna pray that over you. And then if you would allow me as the pastor here to just pray a blessing over you and your home and your family. God, right now, you see every one of us who have wrestled with doubt. Those of us who have wondered if it's worth it, if it's true. And I pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will come down on every one of us and we'll be strengthened as you strengthen Peter, that we'll have the revelation that Peter had. And we'll know that there is nowhere else to go but to you, Jesus, because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Father, I pray that you will show every one of us wrestling in doubt that you are worth it, that you are truth. And I pray that we'll walk in that and we won't be ashamed if we wrestle with it. So God, remind us of this question every moment that doubt creeps in, to whom shall we go? If not Jesus, then who? 
And today I pray a blessing over everyone at every one of our campuses. Father in heaven, I pray that you cause your face to shine upon them. Give them your peace. Give them your rest. I pray that their homes and their businesses be filled with your glory. God, I pray that their children and their grandchildren be filled with your goodness and serve you all the days of their life. And God, I pray that as we go from this place, doubt will subside, faith will arise, and God, we will walk out of here knowing that we are secure in you because you are the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you back here next week. And if you're a guest, we'd love to meet you at Guest Central. God bless. We hope you enjoyed today's message from Bethel Assembly. Pray you have an awesome week and are excited to see you again next week right here at Bethel.ag.